All right, everyone. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it's lovely to see you here on the uh, Friday Masterclass here on Adobe Live, behance.net slash Adobe Live. And uh, today we're going to be talking about five more hidden gems that you should be aware of. You may be aware of some of them already uh, in Premiere Pro, and one of them that's between Premiere Pro and Audition. And actually, several of these little hidden gem features came out of some of the stuff we did about two weeks ago during the video daily creative challenge. So uh, again, some of you may be familiar with these things. If not, this will be a little, uh, this will be totally new, maybe a little bit of a refresher for some things. I tried to cherry pick a couple things that I use a lot, um, but also just things that are kind of undiscoverable. And of course, there's tons of stuff like that <laughs> across all the Adobe apps, let alone just Premiere. So in any case, we're coming to you live on YouTube, Behance, and Twitter Periscope. So thank you so much for joining. See, we've got Valeria and Raul. I am Thor and Luke, Noor, Jay, Minty, Matthew, Steve, Wade. So nice to see all of you. Thank you so much. All right, and we've got Mani and Vern coming to us over there on some of the other channels. And let's see, over here, I had to move my uh, Periscope around. We've got Chris Hahn and uh, Aklim Fonseca, and FL98, and Dez. How's it going? Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, using a little fairy dust. Yes, we uh, <laughs> we all reconfigured our streaming softwares this earlier this week, and I decided to build myself a new little lower third, which is actually courtesy of Adobe Stock. So thank you very much for that, Mogert, whoever you were who provided that one. Um, super cool, right? So easy, just find the ones you want. Okay. Great. All right. So let's go ahead and get started and jump right into Premiere because I want to make sure we get through all of this stuff uh, in time. Okay. So let me go ahead and switch my screen over here and we're going to rock it. What's up, Irving Johnson III and Mercy Roa? How are you? Leafy, what is happening? Leafy was recently one of our uh, creative resident grant recipients who did an amazing project. Leafy, yeah, I, I highly recommend check out her Instagram channel. Really, really cool stuff on there. Um, very, very cool. Okay. All right. So five hidden gems. So the first thing we're going to talk about here, again, now this was something that I revealed during the daily creative challenges uh, and something that I don't hadn't really, I guess, shown many times before because I got a ton of feedback in the Discord. Wow, I never knew that existed or I never even knew that feature was a thing, which is something called Program Monitor Drop Zones. And this is actually a two-part feature. It's a combination of drop zones uh, as well as source, source and track uh, targeting. Stay with me because that part gets a little confusing, but I'm going to try and make it as easy and as intelligible and understandable as possible. All right. So all this content is from uh, an interview, a little uh, interview documentary that I shot uh, quite a few years ago with the man on the right here. His name is Joe Garagiola. He since passed away. Very famous uh, baseball icon. He was a baseball player. He was a color commentator for the later years in his life. Um, but he was just an amazing man, and he's an Arizona. He was an Arizona resident as well, so he's kind of a local hero here. On the left, we've got uh, uh, Derek Hall, who's still the current CEO and president of the Diamondbacks baseball organization. I had the opportunity to interview him for Joe's kind of a tribute to uh, to Joe, quite a few years before he before he passed. In any case, that's the content that we're looking at. Uh, all of this was shot on a variety of different cameras, and. Um, what I want to showcase to you is as you're bringing footage in, now when we did the Daily Creative Challenge, we talked about a lot of different ways to just bring footage into the timeline. So here up in our project bin, I've got a whole series of different clips. Uh, and if I just go ahead and, or even maybe I'll just use the Derek one that's right here. And of course I can play yeah, through and scrub good. through these. You know, for me to be able to sit down with Joe and ask him about his time on the Today Show as a panelist and a reporter, or his time uh, on the Tonight Show filling in for Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. Okay, this is something which I, we've shown this clip before, or that you've heard bits of that clip before. Okay, so from the source monitor, if you want to simply insert or overwrite or replace a piece of footage down in the timeline, you can do that simply by clicking on the footage inside the source monitor. So you can see I've got my cursor right here in the center. So I'm just going to click right in the center. And if you drag over to the program monitor, now you're going to get these drop zones. And again, if you've never done this before, you're probably going to go, what? Has that UI always been there? Well, not always. We introduced this a couple of years ago. 
But this is going to let you do things like insert before, insert where the cursor is, insert after, overlay, replace, and overwrite. OK. So as you might expect, if I simply just say insert, it's now going to place that right where my uh, playhead was, my current time indicator, and it inserted that clip, OK? Now, there's a couple things you need to be aware of uh, with regard to using this, these drop zones. And this is where the source patching uh, or the source, sorry, source targeting and track targeting comes into play. So down in the timeline itself here, we're going to get back to some of these other methods, but I'm trying to show you kind of a roundabout way of how all this works together. You've got these two things here. These are, these are your source patches. And if you hover over them, you should see a little tooltip pop up. Maybe not. Let's see. I'm not getting a tooltip popping up right now. Oh, there's one. OK. Can you see it now? There you go. OK. Source patching for inserts and overwrites. So when you're bringing content in from the source monitor, this is the key, you can use this source patching to tell it where you want the video to go. So for the moment, we're not, I'm not going to focus on track targeting. That's different from source targeting. So I'm actually going to disable these track targets. We don't even need to see these. And in fact, I do this a lot because that, that gets kind of confusing seeing all of those targeted areas in the timeline. Now, by the way, if you don't have anything selected in the, uh, either in your project panel or something already loaded in the source monitor, you will not see this source patching area. It actually will disappear. So it reappears here. In fact, if we close all of these, notice now there's no source patch. There's only track. Uh, track targeting here. You have to have something sourced. Notice the second I click on a clip, it now shows me the patching routing matrix down here in the timeline. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is that this can be used again to insert and overwrite. So let's say that I want this to go to uh, video track two and uh, audio. Well, it's already going to audio track two. That's what I want because we've got music on track three. But the key thing here is now I want to place the video on video track two. So I'm just going to go to the beginning of the next clip. Let's take this one here. We can load it in the source monitor. I can drag it and I can now say insert before or insert after the cursor. It doesn't really matter. Like this. And when I do that, now what you see is that it inserted the video on track two, like I asked, and on audio track two based on these uh, targeted locations. Again, if I wanted to go to say video three, and uh, do we have an extra audio track? Let's go ahead and just add another for the heck of it. I'm going to add a track down here. All right. Let's go to audio track four, drag this same one in. Let's insert before. And it does the same thing. Now you can see the audio is down below the music on track four. All right. And it's up here on video track three. OK. So you can use these source targets to tell it where you want those inserts to go. Now, you can do some other really cool things with this, too. If I target the native track, in other words, the track where the content is already living, I can take a clip. So let's see, we're at the beginning of this one right here. So I can take this clip and I could actually say replace. Replace the footage that's already there. And what it will do is it will insert this clip or whatever this selection is into the space where that original one existed. Now, again, why would you do that? Well, perhaps you've got graphics and other things that are already timed. So it doesn't adjust the duration. Now, what that means is, as you can see down below, apparently the clip that I just inserted there, it was a lot shorter. So these, these uh, diagonal lines are telling me this is just dead space. There was no more footage to fill. But it maintained the duration, OK? So again, though, it's a really easy way to replace your clip uh, in the timeline real simply and real easily. OK, you can also overwrite. All right. Same thing. And if you overwrite again, it's just going to overwrite as much as it needs. But now it cuts to wherever that other clip was before. So as opposed to the replace, it takes out what was ever there, retains the duration. But if your clip is not long enough or if it's too long, the duration doesn't change. It's just going to fill that space, that edit, as opposed to uh, overwrite, which will Again, maintain the space, but only fill as much as, as, as is available there. All right? Super cool, super easy to use. So this is using the drop zones here with source patching. And I get tons of questions about this all the time because this source patching, source targeting, I keep saying patching, it's targeting. 
it, it can be confusing, but once you understand what it's used for and how it works directly with the source monitor, it's real simple. You actually have three methods, three modes here. So another thing that you can do is you can actually insert a gap of silence based on the duration of a clip. So there's three states. So the current blue state that you're seeing here, this, is, this would be considered on, right? So if we toggle them, off, that's off. And then if we hold down the Alt or Option key, all right, this is called silent mode or black, either, e either one of those. I think we've referred to them as both ways in the documentation. So let's say I wanted to insert this clip, but I don't actually want to put this clip in there. I just want the duration of whatever that is, all right, to fill that space. So we can come down here. Let's just say Insert Before, and you see it does just that. So it inserts a gap based on the duration. Now, again, what if I don't want, uh, I don't want, uh, I, I can just insert an audio gap if I so desire. We can turn this off and do the same thing that way, all right? So three modes, right? On, off, hold down control or uh, option, and it goes into silent mode, okay? And again, if you never hit that, modifier key before, you never would have stumbled upon that option there. All right. Polk Music, what's up? Hello. Can you make a keyboard shortcut to switch the source target? You probably can, Cal. You know I'm keyboard shortcut. Uh, uh, I, I have minimal skill with those. But yes, you, pro you probably can. I'm assuming you probably can. I'm always clicking. I'm sure there's a way to probably do that. And if not, that's a great feature request, but I'm sure you probably can. Uh, Sean Davis, cool, answered my question when showing how to source target. Awesome, okay. Now, there's another part of this, which is track targeting. Now this is, we could probably spend an hour talking about track targeting because it gets a little confusing too. Key thing to remember here, track targeting is used for three things. Copy paste, go to next or previous uh, in or out point, in other words, the beginning of the clip, the beginning of the uh, of, of the edit, and match frame to the current clip selected. All right. So let's do. Let's actually make a completely new timeline here. All right. So I'm just gonna make a new sequence from this clip right here. Okay. And I'm gonna turn off all the source patching. All right. So now we're focusing on the inner, the inner uh, series of V one two three A one two three. Uh, selections here. All right. So copy paste. All right. So here we have this video clip. All right. I'm just showing this to you so you get the idea of what track targeting is for. Let's say we copy this clip. All right. And now we're in some other timeline or somewhere else and we want to paste it. All right. Where do we want it to go? Well, obviously, if we just want it to go right after itself, I can just hit Command V or go to paste. And it's going to paste to video one and audio one. But what if I wanted to go to video two and audio three? Let's unselect the others, paste, all right? And now you can see the video is on video two and the audio is on audio three, all right? Same thing, if I wanted to go to video three and audio one, boom, just like that. So if you've ever copy pasted before and you're like, God, why is it always, eh, it's all over the place and bleh. You notice when we created that new sequence, it had all those targets already selected. I don't really know why we do that technically. I guess it I guess it it goes to the the topmost one. I can't remember. I don't know why it's actually enabled like that by default. Because when you copy paste, if you do, I'm sure you've encountered this. It, it can go to weird tracks. You're like, why is it on why is the audio on track five? My videos on one or two or eighty? Bleh. Now you know. All right. So copy paste totally related to track targeting. All right. Another thing related to track targeting, which is extremely, extremely valuable. This is a true hidden gem in every sense of the word, is the go to next shuttle to capabilities when moving through your timeline. All right. So I'm going to undo all the source patching here. Okay. So a lot of times when you're editing, and we did this during the DCC as well, I'm always skipping between, I want to go to the beginning and end of my clips. So as I use my arrow keys here, what you're seeing is, as I'm scrubbing through now, it's just going to the beginning and ending of every clip, okay, 
that's in my timeline, but only on video track one. All right. If I want it to actually stop at the beginning and end of each of the other edits on any particular track, I just need to enable those. And I'm just using the up and down arrows. I'm not using any other modifier. So if I want it to not only here, I'm just trying to find a spot here where, all right. If I want it to go to the beginning and ending of this graphics uh, edit as well, I've now set the V2 target so that it's actually also going to respect video footage there. In fact, here, you know what? I'm going to take these graphics out. Let's just throw, throw a couple of these other ones down here. Oh, and I, I don't have any targets set. Okay. Let's stick one here. Let's stick one there. All right. So now we've got additional video in uh, two and three. All right. Stick this down here. So now, as I move through this, with my track targets V1, 2, 3. Da, 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 da. So now it's at the end of this one. It's at the end of the next one. It's the end of that one. The end of this one. And you can see how it's now, it's not missing anything. So it's skipping between each of the beginnings and endings of each of those edits, right? Now there's other keyboard shortcuts that will automatically allow you to skip between every edit in your timeline. But because we have that function, selection follows playhead, it's really important to know that just by enabling those track targets, actually that's probably why we enable those by default, so that you can use the arrows to skip between every endpoint that's in your timeline. That actually makes sense. But sometimes they become disabled or you've disabled them inadvertently or whatever. So now you know how to get those things back. The other thing that you can use track targeting for, in this case, I'd probably limit it to something like the track where I have my content, is matching the frame and the source monitor. So if I'm looking at this very frame in the program monitor here of Joe, and I want to go to that exact frame in the source, I can hit F, just the key F, and it brings that up in my source monitor. And now I could do something like, export that frame or or do whatever or apply some kind of a motion graphic or something like that. Whenever you need to match that particular frame or get to that particular frame. Similarly, if I wanted to target, you know, something else in this video here, all right, uh, this one here, okay, uh, same thing, I could simply just F to hit that. Oh, and it's telling me there's nothing on that actually. Um, and it's going to match that frame as well. Okay, so based on the target that you have set, it's going to show you whatever that uh, corresponding frame is for that video based on whichever of the targets you have selected there. So matching frame, go to in and out, copy paste, track targeting, insert, overwrite, replace, source targeting. All right. Clear that up. Okay, that's feature number one. Let's look over at our chats. Cal, so it's clipboard targeting instead of source. Well, yes, in terms of copy paste for the track targeting, Cal, yes. <laughs> Technically, yes, I guess you could say that. Mensa Moody, what's up? Sam G, how are you? It's been a while. Okay. Paula O'Brien, yes, that's the trick. Deselect V1 and A1, correct, yes. Because, right, you wind up overwriting your own stuff when you're bringing things in from the source or patching or copying. And I, I've done it on stream, it drives me nuts. And then I get flustered and confused because I sometimes forget. So there you go. Joseph, what is up? How's it going? A lot of people tuning in on Periscope today. All right, okay, next thing. Markers, perfect. So this was something also that um, I uh, we talked about during the daily creative challenge, and that was the ability to add markers. And we used this for a variety of uh, reasons for editing the channel trailer that we were building. All right. Well, I'm not going to just show you how to use markers, but specifically about creating extended markers and adding text and then using the markers panel. So. You've got two different ways that you can add markers. So of course, you have your marker buttons in the timeline. And if you don't have any clips selected, right? so no clip is selected, without anything selected, if you hit Add Marker, it adds that to the timeline. That's not on the clip itself. Now, that's different from if you have a clip selected, like we do right now, and now I hit the marker button, that marker now goes physically into that clip, OK? 
that becomes a clip marker versus a timeline marker. It's still technically the same type of marker. It's just how it gets added. Now, when you're making your selects in the source monitor, and this is what we were doing in the DCC, I find the section that I want. So maybe we want as he's like flipping through his paper. And I hit M, all right? Now, again, I might want to put a little text in here or something that's just going to tell me what about this section is good, what do I like about it. Maybe I just want to give it some additional metadata. So by holding down the Alt or Option key on the marker, I can now click and drag this out. How do you just stop phone calls from coming in altogether? What is the point of Do Not Disturb if it only works when the phone is off? That doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense whatsoever. Oh, that drives me just so bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> Alter option to extend your marker. So now you've got this marker range. OK. So let's go up and go to the Window menu here and go to our marker panel. All right. So the marker panel, which I can dock over here. Now you see the in and out <clears throat> on the clip here. All right. And let's go ahead and double click on this marker. So this will pull up the, uh, the marker panel, which is going to allow you, one, to change the color, two, to give the actual marker a name, and then add your comments. This is the same as adding the name here and adding your comments here, just showing you another different way to do it. All right, so you can right click on the marker, uh, or you can just use inside the markers panel. Change the color here, so I can say, you know, Joe looks at his notes. All right. And then you see now that appears as metadata under the name. And then I'm going to say this is best. You'll see why. All right. Let's do another one here. M. All right. Alt option. Extended. Let's type. Joe looks at, no, Joe raises his hands. Good. All right. And then just for the heck of it, I'm going to add another marker here. Let's double click this. Let's change the color. Joe reads best. OK, and again, I'm going to hold Alt or Option and drag this out. Now, the idea behind this would be that I'm marking up my clips, so I would still have to go and set my in and out points if I wanted to drag these selections into my timeline. And you can do that by using uh, Shift M will move, and then Shift Command M will move back and forth. So Shift M will advance to the beginning of your marker. Shift Command or Shift Control M uh, will move backwards. But it only goes to the beginning of the marker. So these aren't in and out points. We're just marking this to basically lay out the best takes or whatever it is in this long form clip. Now you'll notice, by the way, that with the source monitor open in the marker panel here, as I click between these, you can actually see how it's, it's moving between all the different markers. It's shuttling to that moment in time. So it's pretty cool. The other thing that you can do once you mark up your content is that now all that metadata becomes searchable. So if you have, you can do this in, the, in the, uh, the project panel or here in the marker panel. If I want all of my best takes, if I simply type best, again, based on that metadata, it's going to show me those two best clips. All right. Or in this case, if I want to look for the good one, there's one good one here. All right. So Alt Option on a marker extends the marker duration. You can add a name. You can add descriptions. You can change the marker color. You can change the marker type. There's other metadata and things you could do in there, as you saw in the marker panel. But this is super useful for, again, kind of marking up, making your selects, adding metadata, adding notes. Any notes that you have in there become searchable. That's the key. All right. So a lot of these, I must have some other good stuff in there as well, because those are all populating in there. OK. All right. Let's check our 
questions. Is it best to add markers on the clips instead of on the timeline? So Sean, in the case of what I'm showing you here, when you're doing your selects, in other words, I have, I tend to shoot long clips like in an interview and just let people ramble. And then from there, I pick the best talking points. For that, I want to add that the marker to the clip itself, right? Because as I start cutting and moving things around, if I put them in the timeline, those markers don't mean anything anymore. So for marking and selecting, I do clip markers. If I'm, once I'm cutting, and like, you know, I've got a soundtrack and I know that I need, uh, here, I'm just gonna mute this for a second. I know that I need this, you know, these cuts to happen in a timed way, let's say, all right? So I'm playing back, I'm gonna deselect and like, uh, two, three, four, uh, I need a cut here. Keep on going, uh, two, three, oh, sorry, now I selected a clip. Uh, okay, again, uh, again, all right, uh. Uh, because I'm cutting to music, that's where I use timeline markers, right? Because now I know at this moment, at this moment, at this moment, this is where the cuts have to happen, right? So I'll make my video fit into those sections if I want the cuts to be timed or something like that, okay? So it depends on the situation, but you can do either or, you can do both. You can have markers on your clips and in the timeline. And when you do that, by the way, uh, you'll also notice, so you can see right here actually, so this clip has a marker on it, right? So as I move this around, you'll notice that you can also snap marker to marker, right? Which is pretty cool. So you notice there's that additional little line showing me that we've snapped that, you, I don't know if that's coming through, if you can see that. Looks kind of like an upside down top. That's showing me that we're snapping marker to marker, all right? So again, for synchronization, this was one of the things I showed in the DCC on day four, adding markers to multicam clips and then snapping the markers together. That's how you do that. By the way, if your snapping isn't working, you have to enable snap in timeline. Okay, that's this little magnetic uh, uh, magnet button right here. <laughs> the magnetic mag magnet button, easy for me to say. Keith, is there a reason my shortcuts keep disappearing? Hmm. Do you mean that you're actually not seeing shortcuts that you like custom ones that you've made in the app? That sounds that sounds like a sync problem. Um, so one of the things just diverting for a second here. So keyboard shortcuts are synchronized as part of your uh, CC sync. And cu curiously enough, look, the last time I synced all my shortcuts, workspaces and preferences was in December. <laughs> It's a different time. Gosh, December 2019. It seems like it was a complete, it was a different world. So I'm wondering, have you synced from a different machine or something like that? I wonder if there's something like that. Uh, Keith, you can always hit me up on Twitter and we can follow up with Adobe Care. Um, if this is a consistent problem or something you're just seeing. It's, I can't say I'm having a problem with it, but th those things periodically can can crop up. So yeah, just follow up with me and let me know, all right? Uh, okay, phone will pass the call through if it's from a favorite, even on Not Disturb. Yeah, no, and I, 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 do, I have the Do Not Disturb and it's not a favorite. It just rang through because the app, the, the app is, the uh, device is open. And it's because I'm using the chat here on the iPad. And of course, I'm looking at uh, Periscope on the phone. So unfortunately, I can't use phone mo uh, plane mode because then I can't be connected. So, all right, that's right. We can, I'll, I'll yell at Apple later. <laughs> all right, Mensa, j Dog with the gems. Thank you so much, Minty, what's up? Okay, very cool. Uh, no, it's the basic shortcuts from the previous version, like I and O. Oh, those are disappearing for you? I can't, uh, I don't know why they would. Those are, those are built-in standards, so I'm not sure. Uh, may, it could be a preferences corruption or something. I mean, th again, those are like de facto standard, uh, shortcuts that are installed, so I don't know why those would disappear. Um, but again, follow up with me and we can, and we can look into it. Okay. So, uh, drop zones, source and track targeting, that's one. Markers, 
Alt Option to extend marker, add metadata, search on markers, drag things in. That's number two. Number three is video and audio and libraries. OK, so this is very exciting. And I think I may have shown this once or twice before, but this is probably something that many of you are just unaware of. So we have the ability, as of June, actually, it may be April for video and audio, for audio and then June for video, you can now add your own video clips and audio clips to CC libraries. Yes. Now, that doesn't uh, change the way, like if you're already using Adobe Stock Video. So uh, if you have Adobe Stock Video, you can see here, so I'm in my one of my many libraries. I have a couple dozen libraries that I use, but this is Jason's library is kind of my main one. So if I go under the video twirl down, this is showing all of the content that I've licensed or have previews of from Adobe Stock. But I can now also add my own video in here. Now, I've talked about this before in terms of using Mogurts, right? So remember, motion graphics templates, which can contain video and things like logo bugs and other stuff like that. I've talked about creating stuff in After Effects, saving as a Mogurt. So like, let's say you have your animated lo logo bug or your sparkly, particle lower third, and you always want to use that. Having that in libraries makes it so, so easy. And in fact, that one I was just talking about that I licensed, my little particle reveal lower third, you can see it right here, all right? But you don't have to do that now. So like I have a bunch of overlays for my kids' show that are alpha-based, where it just shows the title of the show. And what if I want to always have access to those elements? Or again, my alpha-channeled rotating spinny logo bug, or whatever. Shorter video is better, by the way. I think you can store up to, a, I think each file can be up to a gig. I don't know if we've got anybody from Adobe Karen here. We need to check that out for sure. I'm not certain, um, but I think so. In any case, let's go to the desktop here. Now, the, the confusing thing about this is, at present, to add video or audio into libraries, you have to do it from the desktop, from the Finder or from Explorer. Why exactly, I don't know. It's just a current limitation uh, of the panel. But that's OK. It's drag and drop, all right? So for instance, <clears throat> here I have this little swirl graphic, which is something that I licensed years ago when I was doing the graphics for this, uh, this original show. It's 218 megs. It's QuickTime with Alpha Channel. So it's obviously 444. I want to be able to use this all the time and access this all the time. I don't even know what where the project is for this anymore. You can see I made this December 4th, 2011. <laughs> Good grief, man. Get some new content. No. All right. So, uh, and it's just funny. I just happened to stumble on this folder. and I thought, oh, these are cool things I'd like to reuse. All right. So I can take this from the Finder, drag it over to the library. Notice it says Add to Library and drop it. And based on your internet speed and all that stuff, it will automatically now get added into your library, just like that. So now I can add this to my project. OK. It imports it, brings it into my little folder right here. You can see that it's now in the project. And I can hover scrub this. And if I wanted to now place this over top of Joe, let's say like right about here, we're going to have a little transition. All right. Seems a little out of context there, but that's fine. <laughs> there you go. Video. All right. Let's take it a little step further. So I wonder if you can do, I don't know if you can do multiples. Uh, let's see. So this is the just text. What's the difference with these? You can tell this is a long time ago because the graph, the, the fonts and the colors were interesting for, for sure. Let's see if we can do multiples at one time. I don't know if it lets you. Well, maybe it does. There you go. All right. So these are my Just Play Music overlays. All right. Let's add it to the project. Add to project. I kind of wish it let you stay in this window, to be honest, but that's okay. It's kind of cool that it bounces over. 
And now let's drag this in. One, two, three, play. Oh, it's the wrong frame size. <laughs> That's okay. Scale to frame size. Scale to frame size. Scale to frame size. All right. Oh, I thought those animations were so, I was so proud of those at the time. <laughs> Look at that. That's like, that's before we changed uh, the motion blur settings in After Effects. That was the default. That's not quite enough blur there. You're seeing all of the, uh, all of the repeats, but in any case, all right. So video into libraries and audio is the same. So if we go back to libraries here, let's twirl up videos. Let's go to audio. So now again, by default, if you're using Adobe stock audio, this is where you will find all of the things that you've previewed or licensed and you can see them uh, here. So he, these are all the various ones that I've previewed. I've licensed a couple of these right here. All right. But these are all the previews that I've dragged into projects, probably during uh, some of the things that we've done here. Okay. Um, in fact, though, this one, I think we did this on one of the other streams. This is uh, my little creature doing his shark puppet imposter voice. So this is my own sample. Let's take this. Let's see. You. <laughs> you. 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 All right. That's my own audio file. Same thing. If I've got an audio file in here, I don't. I don't actually think I've got any specific audio files right here. Let's see what what might this be. Well, let's see what it is. We'll drag it in and find out. Go into libraries. And it's the same process as with video. Add to library. All right. It does just that. All right. Add to project. Imports the file. And now, of course, I can double click and just see this looks like it was probably lab audio or something. Oh, some piano playing. I have no idea what this is from. Okay, there you go. Well, now that's living in my libraries. And of course, if I don't want that there, and I don't really, uh, I can simply right click and I can delete it and take it out of libraries. And similarly, if I don't want these things in, in there anymore, I can do the same thing and quickly delete them. All right. So having your own audio and video clips in CC libraries simply by dragging and dropping right from the timeline, right? Pretty cool. We like that. All right. Does this give you all the info? Yeah, and just to show you again, so because I know people, I see some people asking, well, what, what formats does it support? Uh, well, for certain, it supports QuickTime movies and WAV files and MP3 files. I'm sure there are some video formats that probably aren't ideal for libraries. But case in point, this uh, mu music text solo alpha that we just grabbed and dragged in there, you can see it's ProRes 444, right, with the alpha channel. So I, I imagine it probably also works with animation codec. If you're doing stuff with alpha channel, I wouldn't recommend using animation in 2020. ProRes 4444 is, you know, ideal and great and performs really well. Um, but you can see here, easy, simple, supported, and it just kind of works. All right. Very cool. Adam as talk dog. You've been going through your early 2000 3D renders shutter, right? I know. It's just sort of funny to look like. And I thought that was, you know, that was pretty hot for maybe not pretty hot. It was, well, remember, this was a kid's show. So, you know, I wasn't going for. I didn't have the skill to go for anything beyond what you just saw there. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Armando, uh, the element that you add to your library in the computer, where is it located when you add to your timeline? Ah, so that's a great question. So notice, when, when you add it to your library, it's just in the library, meaning that wherever you launch Premiere or whatever, or any app, it's just sitting in, in your CC storage. So it only gets added to your project when you say add to project. And at that point, it actually downloads the media and it, it, it adds it to whatever, you know, uh, and, and in terms of where it goes, that's based on your, your settings of where downloaded, there's a, there's a, sorry, I'm not explaining that very well. Under your project settings, under scratch disks. So CC libraries downloads, the default is the same as the project, okay? So wherever this project lives, when I download stuff from libraries into my project, it's going to go into this folder location, and then it's going to live inside the bin in my project there, OK? And of course, you can change this path. You could have it go to an external disk or whatever you want. But the default for any library's downloads is the same as your project folder, OK? Can we make our Premiere Pro timeline like the Final Cut Pro X magnetic timeline? So, Subrat. Uh, short answer, no. That's on how Premiere Pro works. However, that is how Rush works. So if you're looking for that dynamic magnetic timeline where it's always, there's no, it's gapless because anytime you move stuff around, it's snapping and keeping everything locked together. That's actually how Rush functions. Now, you may see some of that. And there's ways to kind of do that in Premiere, but that's not the default way that Premiere works. That is the default way that Premiere Rush works. Okay. Mensa Moody, Jelly Roll Morton, yes. Excellent. Uh, I think you are absolutely correct on that. The track, the music track that I was playing here. Very nice. Sean Davis, how many gigabytes will Adobe allow you to save clips to your CD? So as, as I said, I think the file size max is a gig. I, th I, I think so. And when you think about it, remember, you're storing this in the cloud. So and it, the idea is like quick access, like those little graphical overlays, I, I'm going to use those a lot. My logo bug, I'm going to use that a lot. My, it could just be a static ping, uh, you know, with alpha channel, I'm going to use that a lot. So they're probably a little smaller because I want to be able to grab them freely easily. But I, th I believe you have up to a gig. It might even be two, but I, I think the file size is a gig. I'd have to, I have to look into that. Are the libraries always cloud, or can you add stuff on a local drive that stays there and doesn't get uploaded? Um, libraries are, CC libraries are, are cloud-based. Now, with elements like motion graphics templates, when you license things, you can download. So once you download, you have the physical media. So that's the thing. You have to download it to have a physical copy. Otherwise, it's always going to live in the cloud. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Jamie Griffin, great hidden gems today. Thanks. Oh, you're so very welcome. All right. Umicorn, how are you doing? Valder, what's going on? All right. All right, you're very welcome for answering, Subrat. OK. OK, so that was number three. OK, we've got uh, nine more minutes. All right, so number four, hidden gem. Now, this is this may seem like, did he run out of stuff to show us? No. <laughs> This is uh, this is a bit smaller in terms of uh, um, what am I trying to say? This is something which you probably didn't stumble upon or didn't know about, but it's really useful, which is a separate, dedicated, customizable time code panel. So you know you always have your time code in your program monitors. And then based on the type of edits that you're doing, you know, if you're doing like slip and slide edits or whatever, uh, there's there's different elements and different things that you can do uh, just in terms of how you're viewing and using time code in the program and source monitor. But a lot of times, as things are playing and as you're doing your as you're cutting stuff together, it's kind of essential to know like what's my total time of this timeline? What's the absolute time? What's the source media time? What clip am I actually playing? Because you might have stacked clips and it's hard to, hard to sort of understand what's going on. Under the window menu, you will notice that you have a dedicated time codes uh, option here. Now, here's the thing. And here's probably this is why I say you probably didn't use it if you tried to open it. Let's go ahead and open this. 
Oh shoot, did those stay in there? Ah, oh, mother. Okay. <laughs> Arg! Nah! Nah! That's not the default. I was just making some presets beforehand and I forgot to clear it. Okay. Let's, oh God, we're gonna rewind. So let's go uh, to the window menu and let's go ahead and choose the time code option. And probably this is why you never used it. Let's choose time code. <sighs> oh no, it's retaining it again? I think it's because I made presets. That must be why. All right, <laughs> I'm not rewinding myself again. First time viewers are going, what is happening? All right, when you open the time code panel, this is what you see, nothing. So you're like, oh cool, I'll just play back. I should see time code. Yeah. Yeah. But no, you're not seeing anything. That's because you need to add, <laughs> it's interesting to say add line. I don't, all right. Premiere team, if you're watching, does that help? Mm -mm. Add line, okay. How about add time code? <laughs> what kind of time code do you want? So the first thing it's gonna give you is your master time code, all right? But if you right click there, you'll notice that you have a display option. And under display, you can say master, absolute, duration, in, out, remaining, top clip name. And you can also choose which source tracks time code you're referencing. Oh, cool. So let's keep this first one master. Let's add another line. And now this one, let's show absolute, and let's add another line here. And let's do in and out. And let's add one more line here. Now it's interesting that that's that's crazy. Uh, it's hard. It's got some UI issue here because it really should zoom out so I can see everything. And under display here, let's go to actually let's do top clip name and this one instead of absolute, we're going to be time remaining. Okay, so now what you're seeing, right? If I'm scrubbing through here, and this is all muted, but notice how it's changing the remaining time for the clip that I'm on. It's changing the top clip name. Again, if there are in and out points, you would see that reflected here. But this is just another really super awesome way to monitor your time code. Now, by the way, you will notice this is not a dockable panel. This is modal, meaning that this is a constantly floating window. So this is one of those things where, unlike me, everybody, most everybody has three monitors these days or two monitors at a minimum. You know, you stick this off onto another monitor and then you keep it really huge, right? So that you can really see what's happening, right? If you're a serious editor, you know, chances are you're probably using time code. I'm mildly serious, so I don't I don't go to this all that often. But again, things like remaining in out, that's super useful and absolute. I just I love these values. I just love having a dedicated panel that's nothing but time code. The other thing as you may have noticed is that you can also create presets. So whereas before, you can see we were seeing the master, remaining and top clip name. That's a preset that I made. So I always want to see those things. Or I just want master only. Or again, we could re-add all the other ones and make a new preset. You can see it's real easy. Save preset, manage presets. If you go into manage, again, here's where you can choose keyboard shortcuts for these, for those of you who are shortcut inclined, or we can just delete them all together and take them out of there, whatever you want. Um, it just makes it really simple. So a dedicated time code panel in Premiere as hidden gem number four, all right? Tiny but obscure, nobody would ever find that. Thank you, Paula O'Brien. No, I totally agree. I, it, I mean, it's a fantastic feature. I, it got added probably three years ago. But as I said, if you've never made a preset, when you open it for the first time, it opens blank. So <laughs> you're probably thinking like, oh, it must be broken or what? that's what I would think. And I work here, you know, so, uh, it's a good idea to investigate. All right, great to know, JD, thank you. Leafy's laughing, Jurgen's laughing. All right. <laughs> Very cool, okay. And for the last one, which is one that I've showcased here many a time, it is uh, the classic edit in audition. So here- To me now, uh, breathing. 
I'd love to keep breathing is what I'd like to keep doing. All right. If you're in a timeline and you momentarily need to do something to a clip, whether it's like remove a pop or just do some kind of an audio edit, it's a little more challenging to do on the Premiere side and you want to do it destructively, you can simply right click, control click, and choose to edit the clip in Adobe Audition. Now, when you do that, it's going to perform a render and replace, meaning that your original audio remains untouched. It's going to swap that out with a copy, all right? It'll launch Audition if it isn't already running, and then place that audio uh, inside of Audition's waveform view right here, all right? So again, this is where we could like look at this spectrally. Now, there's no noise. Oh, look at that. It looks like I've already removed any low frequency hum. If there were any, this is like really super clean and nice. Let's say that I wanted to do, I don't know. What matters most to me now, uh, breathing. I'd love to keep breathing is what I'd like to keep doing, but. Uh... All right, so let's just say I wanted to do something wacky here. All right, I'm going to add a delay. Doing, 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 but uh, doing. All right, we're gonna add a spectral-based delay. This is just to make an obvious change. So again, this isn't what I would normally use this for, but I've done it for sound design. So let's go into analog delay here. And uh, let's just try and get some kind of a cool repeat going on this. Let's see here. Let's see how this sounds. Okay, so we're applying the delay only to those selected frequencies and only on those words. This you can't do this in Premiere. Like to keep doing, but uh, that's what matters most. Okay, like to keep doing, but uh, that's what matters. And the key is there. I applied it to just the mid range, so it's just a nice little mid rangey echo just on those specific frequencies. Okay, my point is that now that I've done some change to this in Audition, if I go to File, Save, now you'd have to look really quickly, but when I click back to Premiere, that audio clip just blinked. So now when I rewind this, and I play back, what I'd like to keep doing, but that's what the Keep breathing is what I'd like to keep doing, but uh, that's what matters most. Okay? Simple. So, plosives, popping peas, you want to remove those real easily with Audition's FFT filter, edit in Audition. A little bit of sibilance, you can use the declicker or the declipper, edit in Audition. You want to add for sound design some kind of spectral based effects only to a sp specific frequency range, edit in Audition. Noise. We have good noise tools in Premiere. We have more of them on Audition. Your timeline is locked. I just need to fix this one clip. It's noisy. Edit in Audition. Non-destructively swaps it out. Simple, easy. And then what I'll normally do, if I have the file names turned off for the tracks here. Uh, if I go ahead and turn these back on, show audio names. All right, you can see that this is called now Audio Extracted. So this is telling you that this is a copy. But what I normally do when I have a back and forth like that with an edit, uh, edit in Audition is I'll just change the label color just to kind of remind myself that that audio has been changed. All right? And that's it, my friends. Five hidden gems. Edit in Audition. The Timeline panel via the Window menu. Saving your own video and audio files inside of CC Libraries adding extended markers using the Alt or Option key so that you can add metadata, descriptions, names, and other searchable items in there. And then we started with drop zones and how to use source and track targeting. So again, thank you so much for joining. We've got the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge coming up next. So stick around for that. And uh, seeing as it's Friday, I hope everyone has a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and a wonderful weekend. We will see you next Friday, uh, the 11th. And uh, that following week, I'll be back doing two special broadcasts based on video here on Adobe Live during the week uh, with my good friend Vashi Nedomansky. So that's uh, the week of the 17th. So you'll definitely want to check that out. In any case, have a great one. For those of us in the US, have a great Labor Day weekend. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time. So long, everybody. Bye-bye.